occasion to be led by Father Samuel Clarin, SVD, University Chaplain. And please remain standing for the singing of the Philippine National Anthem to be led by the USC Choristers. Let us be aware of God's presence in each and every one. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Almighty and gracious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, source of life, source of wisdom. In your manifold wisdom, you created us for a purpose. You created us to be your partners in building and establishing your kingdom here on earth. Instill in us, your people, to develop the gifts you have bestowed on us so that we can be living witnesses of your divine love. As we gather this afternoon for the visit and keynote speech of Professor Finn Erling Kidlan, we ask for your continued blessing on him and his family. Strengthen him with your grace and power that he may continue to be the light of the world. Give him the necessary wisdom to lead his hearers with realistic foresight, fraternal charity, humble service, and to be men and women of peace. Bless us too witness this historic event give us a strong sense of civic and religious responsibility amidst political and economic crisis we are facing currently may we do our part quietly and unpretentiously with faith and perseverance we ask this in the name of Jesus the divine word who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit God forever and ever in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father Clarine. Ladies and gentlemen, the Philippine National Anthem. Thank you, USA Choristers. Ladies and gentlemen, you may now be seated. Reverend Father Roderick C. Salazar, Jr., SVD, the University President, will now give the welcome address. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to see you here, and welcome to the University of San Carlos and this dialogue with our guest Nobel laureate for economics, Professor Finn Erling Kidlan. Though this may sound strange to us, let me dare say that our being here today may be traced in some way to a line 
in a French newspaper in 1888. It was an obituary which read, when translated from French, the merchant of death is dead. No doubt a good pun, as puns go, although the message was morbid. But it made one man sit up and reflect on his life. And because he did, we have what we are having today. And why is that? The man who read his own obituary, together with all the other newspaper readers, was the person referred to by that line, which meant that it was a premature obituary. Much like what happened to Mark Twain in the United States, news had circulated that the writer had died which made Mark Twain remark, the report of my death has been exaggerated. Much like what happened to Harry Truman in the United States, politically speaking, a candidate for the American presidency, he was written off politically by the Chicago Tribune on November 3, 1948 in a headline that said, Dewey defeats Truman. It was the opposite that was actually true. Truman defeated Dewey. And one of the beautiful pictures later on printed was Truman himself holding off the newspaper that declared that he had been defeated. In the case I am referring to today, it was a man called Alfred Bernard Nobel who read his premature obituary. But why was such a line that he was called the merchant of death? This was because his name was associated to prizes given to outstanding persons in, discipl in various disciplines. Alfred Nobel was more known before that as the inventor of dynamite. A Swedish chemist, engineer, innovator, and armaments manufacturer, Alfred Nobel found that when nitroglycerin was incorporated in an absorbent inert substance like kisigul or diatomaceous earth, it became safer and more convenient to handle, and that this mixture be patented in 1867 as dynamite. Alfred Nobel inventor of dynamite and dynamite doing what it could exploding for better or for worse the obituary said Dr. Alfred Nobel who became rich by finding ways to kill more people faster than ever before died yesterday so to the writer of that obituary Nobel was the merchant of death. And who would ever like that title to be the memory you leave behind? Not you, not me, and certainly not Alfred Nobel. So he decided that if he could, he would rather be remembered for something else. So on November 27, 1895, at the Swedish Norwegian club in Paris, Nobel signed his last will and testament 
and set aside the bulk of his estate to establish the Nobel Prizes to be awarded annually without distinction of nationality. He died of a stroke on December 10, 1896 at San Remo, Italy. He left 31 million kronor, at that time equivalent to 4,223,500 US dollars, which by last year had grown to more than 100 million US dollars. In his will, Nobel wrote, the whole of my remaining realizable estate shall be dealt with in the following way. The capital invested in safe securities by my executors shall constitute a fund, the interest on which shall be annually distributed in the form of prizes to those who during the preceding year shall have conferred the greatest benefit on mankind. And so it was that since then, each December 10, on the anniversary of Nobel's death, the prize-winning, prize-awarding bodies announce the Nobel Prize winners. The Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences choose the awardees for physics, economics, and chemistry. The Swedish Academy chooses the awardee for literature. The Nobel Assembly at the Karolinska Institute choose the winner for physiology or medicine, and the Norwegian Nobel Committee chooses the Nobel winner for peace. Winners receive a financial award, a diploma, and a gold medal. In 2004, our guest of honor today won the award for economics. The reason why he is here with us today has its own historical development. The details of that we can read in our brochure and may be further explained by the man himself who started sharing the wisdom and knowledge of the Nobel laureates with the rest of the world. Our guest, Dr. Uwe Morowitz. The fact is that having shared the Nobel laureates with Thailand last year, he thought he might expand the program called Bridges, Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace to the Philippines. And we, the University of San Carlos, are most happy and honored that we are one of the few institutions in the country chosen to host these dialogues this year. Only last month we hosted Dr. David Gross, Nobel Laureate for Physics. That was in our Talamban campus. Now here, today, in our main campus, in our latest facility, we are hosting Professor Kidland. And this building, which houses our schools of law and graduate business, this is named after Father Ernest Herdeman, one of our missionary priests who worked hard to put up our facilities in this site after the destruction caused by World War II. As we gather today, we look forward to tasting the knowledge and wisdom of our guest, which merited the Nobel Prize for Economics. And to appreciate what he will be sharing with us, it is good that, he, that we clear our minds of a few biases against economics or that we must develop an appreciation for it. For example, we must review what economics is not. Someone once wrote an experience 
I was riding my bike down a hill in my city one night and two policemen stopped me at their speed trap. They asked me how fast I was going, 63 kilometers, and congratulated me on the accuracy of my speedo. Then they asked me why I was not driving a car as I was a woman. Wasn't it dangerous to be out at night on a bike? I said, said the writer, I did not drive a car. They then asked me my occupation. I said, an economist. One of the policemen said, that's why she's riding a bike. She's economizing. But of course, that is not really what an economist is. And there's this little story that when Albert Einstein died, he met three Filipinos in the queue outside the pearly gates. To pass the time, he asked what were their IQs. The first replied, 190. Wonderful, exclaimed Einstein. We can discuss the contributions made by Ernest Rutherford to atomic physics and my theory of general relativity. He asked the second, what's your IQ, sir? 150. Good, said Einstein. I look forward to discussing the role of nuclear-free legislation in the quest for world peace. And the third mumbled, 50. And Einstein paused and then asked, so what is your forecast for the budget deficit this year? That, of course, is the misconception. What we shall hear is the real wisdom and knowledge of an economist. And you will know why he received the Nobel Prize for economics. So we are honored, privileged, and happy to have him with us, to have you to listen to him. And as host of the University of San Carlos, I welcome you all. May we all have a wonderful time. Thank you. Thank you, Father Salazar, for that enlightening backgrounder on the Nobel phenomenon, as well as a short crash course on economics. Moving on now, may we call on Dr. Uwe Moravets, founding chairman of the International Peace Foundation, to explain to us the rationale behind the Bridges program. And welcome to the first ASEAN event series, Bridges Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace. Bridges is facilitated by the International Peace Foundation, a non-political and non-religious foundation under the common patronage of 21 Nobel Peace Prize laureates based in Vienna. The events are hosted in cooperation with various local partners, including the country's major universities and schools. Having started in November 2007, Bridges is being continuously held in the Philippines and Thailand until April 2008, involving the participation of Nobel laureates from all fields. The first ASEAN-wide series of Bridges is an independent contribution to the Decade for a Culture of Peace and Nonviolence, initiated by the United Nations General Assembly. It follows the series of 250 Bridges events which the International Peace Foundation has already hosted in Thailand between November 2003 and April 2005. Increasing ethnic, political, 
religious and social conflicts and the helplessness to respond to them without further stimulating the spiral of violence show us peace is not a given good. It has to be constantly learned, experienced, and created anew. Peace is not a passive state. It is a process which needs time, attention, and the partici participation of all of us. And peace begins with education. The seeds of peace need to be planted in schools, in universities, in the new generation. This is why the International Peace Foundation cooperates with major schools and university as well as UNESCO in realizing this Bridges program. We believe in the importance of the education and scientific community of the Philippines by bringing the knowledge and wisdom of Nobel laureates for peace, physics, chemistry, medicine and economics to this country. What these highly in demand Nobel laureates normally see of a country are airports and hotels. They deliver their lecture, stay for one night, and leave. We have invited them here not only to speak, but to share, to engage, to listen. They come here not for one day or one event only, but for various dialogues in different parts of the country, without requesting any honorarium, because of their real interest in building bridges, because of their real interest in the Philippines. It is our hope that these are not the first and final visits of these Nobel laureates, but visits with many fruitful returns to build long-lasting friendships and to start, for instance, research programs or other forms of cooperation with the local universities and schools. This is how bridges could develop into a long-term and sustainable success for the Philippines to strengthen education as a basis for peace. I thank Father Salazar, the University of San Carlos, and the organizing committee of today's events for taking up this opportunity of our cooperation and for inviting today the 2004 Nobel Laureate for Economics, Professor Finn Kidland, to this prestigious school. We look forward to his keynote speech and to his important contribution to build bridges. Maraming salamat po, mabuhay, and welcome, Professor Kidland. And now, ladies and gentlemen, may we call on Dr. Victorina Sosa, Director of the Office of Research of the University of San Carlos, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Is a Nobel laureate born or made? His early education experience is not unfamiliar to us living in a developing country. Growing up in a farming community, the eldest of six children, he attended an elementary school which met the students only twice or thrice a week. He was the only student in his class who went beyond elementary school. He attended the nearest high school where, which nurtured his talent for mathematics. After graduating from high school, he spent a year teaching graders. Due to the shortage of elementary teachers, high school graduates were hired on a temporary basis. During his spare time, he took a correspondence course in accounting and worked as an accountant for a teacher in junior high school. Another year was spent completing the mandatory military service. His academic career began when he received his BA in economics from the Norwegian School of Economics and Business Administration and his PhD in Economics from Carnegie Mellon. Edward Prescott insisted to be chair of his dissertation committee. He joined the faculty of the University of California in Santa Barbara in 2004 as the holder of the Jeff Henley Chair in Economics after his previous appointment from Carnegie Mellon University. He is a research associate for the Federal Reserve Banks of Dallas, Cleveland, and St. Louis, and a senior research fellow at the University of Texas at Austin. He is an adjunct professor at the Norwegian School of Economics and Business Administration. He has held visiting scholar and professor positions at the Hoover Institute, institution 
and a university in Buenos Aires, Argentina, among others. He was elected as the Fellow of the Econometric Society in 1992. He was awarded the 2000 Nobel Prize in Economic Science jointly with Professor Edward Prescott of Arizona State University. They received the Nobel Prize for their contribution to dynamic macroeconomics, namely the time consistency of economic policy and the driving forces behind business cycles. Their 1977 study of time inconsistency showed that policymakers lose credibility and thus leverage over the economy when policies are inconsistent over time. If economic policymakers lack the ability to commit in advance to a specific decision rule, they will often not implement the most desirable policy later on. Their work established the foundation for an extensive research program on the credibility and political feasibility of economic policy. It is also credited for a shift that has largely influenced the reforms of central banks and the design of monetary policy in many countries over the last decade. The duo transformed the theory of business cycles by integrating it with the theory of economic growth. Their 1982 paper turned Keynesian theory upside down by finding that business cycles were caused by supply sh side shocks rather than shocks to the society's aggregate demand. Their results revealed that technology growth fluctuation explained most of the post-war pattern in U.S. business cycles. Later on, the 1990s IT boom provided a good example. The laureates laid the groundwork for more robust models by regarding business cycles as the collective outcome of countless forward-looking decisions made by individual households and firms regarding consumption, investment, labor supply, and so on. Another novel feature was the method to calibrate a model with information from micro-studies and to generate synthetic time series for important macro variables by simulation. The model became a laboratory for large-scale economic experiments. More recently, his research focused on the role of monetary policy for the business cycle. He has studied Ireland and Argentina in the belief that there is a lot for other nations' policymakers to learn from the successes and failures of these two nations. In his autobiography, he made allusions to luck. His choice of mathematics as an elective area of concentration during his undergraduate years. He's taking a course offered by Stan Thor, who later on encouraged him to apply as his research assistant in Carnegie Mellon. He's continuing collaboration with his dissertation advisor, Ed Prescott, his work with eminent researchers throughout his academic career, and his meeting of Tonya. He tends to, to bring researchers from all over the world for periods of time to brainstorm on questions and anomalies in macroeconomics and finance. Carolinian committee, a community and distinguished guests, I am privileged and honored to introduce the 2004 Nobel Laureate in Economic Science, Professor Finn Kidlan. Ladies and gentlemen, dear students, good afternoon. Um, please be seated. <laughs> I want to start off by thanking you all for your hospitality. Tanya and I were overwhelmed by the friendliness we experienced as we arrived on campus. Uh, I told her no doubt they had heard that she's very instrumental in, uh, uh, in my coming because I never leave the North American continent without her. So uh, obviously you were all applauding for her, uh, maybe a little bit for me as well. Uh, what I'll t talk about today is largely based on my research. The uh, portion that's not so clearly based on my research is the thing involving peace. Uh, 
So it's with a certain amount of trepidation that I include the word peace in my title because uh, you might debate whether I'm really qualified to talk to uh, to talk much about peace. Um, the one thing I might mention is that I've had the good fortune to be invited to uh, a conference once a year uh, since 2005, a conference arranged by uh, Elie Weissel, Weiss the Peace Prize winner from many years ago, uh, a conference arranged by him and, uh, and the King of Jordan jointly. A and this conference has gone under the title um, Building a, a Better World or a Saving the World uh, and is clearly geared towards thinking about what can be done to assure uh, a more peaceful world. And uh, one thing Elie Weissel has done is uh, this conference, largely of Nobel laureates, but also uh, uh, experts from uh, different areas, he's divided the conference into four groups. Uh, one of which is economic development, the group in which I've uh, participated the most. And so I, I, I take that as a sign that, just like me, Elie Weissel believes that there is a strong interconnection between peace and economic development. So that's going to be my uh, subject, uh, focusing on mostly on what I've done research on myself. Um, the, um, I, I have three motivating slides in the form of pictures of real GDP per capita for a number of countries. Uh, and uh, I think you'll find these slides interesting and, uh, and uh, they would be uh, reasonably important for what I'll do. Uh, I, I can stand here talking for a while uh, uh, about other things. Um, how are you doing? I'm fine too. Um, oh, there we go. Uh, but it's still the case that I won't have control myself. This is a slide that uh, talks about my the experience with Ely Sales Conference. And by the way, the fourth annual conference will take place in. Uh, in Petra, Jordan in June of this year. And uh, Tanya and I plan to go to that as well. Okay, uh, now I'm happy. Uh, this, this is a, uh, as I was saying, I have some three slides picturing real GDP per capita uh, for a number of countries. This particular slide, uh, well, they're all from 1950 till, uh, till about 2005. And um, every attempt has been made to make them, uh, to make the countries comparable. Uh, it's not easy to, uh, to uh, compare activity across nations with different exchange rates and, uh, and so on. These numbers are taken from something called the World Pen Tables, and uh, and the uh, the numbers have been uh, um, are, are in the form of purchasing power parity, uh, real U.S. dollars. Uh, now, this first slide seems a little idiosyncratic, maybe. At the top is uh, the United States, a reasonable benchmark, and then uh, a, a number of countries. I will draw your attention to um, uh, not uh, oh, sorry I'm supposed to point in this direction uh, I will draw your there we go I will draw your attention to uh, uh, I believe I have a I need my watch otherwise Uwe Moravets will be very mad with me and if I don't keep track of time. 
Uh, ah, here we go. So I'll draw your attention to, for example, this light blue line. That's Argentina, a country to which I'll return later in the talk. Uh, Argentina moved reasonably well. In fact, Argentina in, uh, in uh, about 120 years ago was one of the uh, five or six most well-to-do nations in the world. Uh, it has since fallen on hard times. As you can see, it was somewhat b below uh, the United States uh, and uh, these countries up here. Uh, and the curve has really flattened out after 1980, as you can see. Um, there are some other interesting countries. This uh, future line, uh, that would be the Philippines. Um, the Philippines, uh, that curve is growing steadily. Uh, although you might argue it'd be nice if it grew faster. Um, at the very bottom is uh, Afghanistan, and uh, and I suppose I'm already making a slight point by by observing that a country uh, hit by s as much conflict as Afghanistan, they are going to have a tough time uh, even growing. Uh, the uh, it stayed very low and actually been falling in uh, in the past 10 or 15 years. Um, this this curve, this uh, picture, it's a collection of countries in Europe, and uh, they're uh, they pretty much grow together. Um, there are a couple of laggards, uh, especially in the beginning. Um, Greece and um, uh, Greece and Spain uh, are kind of the laggards in the beginning down here, uh, and they were also uh, joined in that lagging position by Ireland. Now, as you can see, in uh, about 1990, there's a big change. That's that's the most startling thing in this picture uh, to see how Ireland suddenly takes off. And then it shoots to the very top of the picture. Ireland has be behaved so well, so spectacularly, it's sometimes referred to as the Celtic Tiger. Uh, now, part of the premise of my talk is I think there's a lot to learn from uh, studying countries that do well and study uh, countries who don't do well. And uh, I have studied in detail uh, these two countries with various co-authors, these two countries, Argentina and Ireland, and I'll use them as examples later on. Let me uh, show the third uh, picture, and that's a much more depressing picture. I if you paid attention to the vertical axis, students are always taught to pay particular attention to the scale of the vertical axis. Hope you did. Uh, if you noticed, in the previous two pictures, the vertical scale went from zero to $40,000. Here, the scale goes from zero to 3,000. So this is like, at the very, all of this picture would, in the other two, uh, it would have taken place at the very bottom. We wouldn't even have, we would hardly have seen them. Uh, they would have been like Afghanistan. Uh, and, and these are, uh, these are just illustrations of what happens in, uh, in countries under various, uh, various conflicts from time to time. Uh, some of these were peace, peaceful for a while and then uh, war or unrest broke out and all of this has resulted in them being marred at the, at the very bottom of uh, the I income distribution across countries. Um, 
I don't know if I need to uh, draw attention to any, any of these countries in particular. You probably know as much about their history as I do. Now, let me, uh, let me now give an overview of the talk. The, um, the first thing I'll do is just give you a sense of the framework used in modern macroeconomics. And, uh, and I think of that as part of what Prescott and I do, did, uh, um, mainly through the second paper that was mentioned, the 1982 paper. Um, what, what we did was show how to put people explicitly in economic models, and, then, uh, n and not just people, but also uh, businesses, and, and uh, depending on the question we're an, uh, addressing, the government or the foreign sector, and so on. And so I'll, uh, I'll talk through two or three slides about that. Then I'll bring up what I think is a crucial issue when it comes to policy making. And that is, even without thinking about political conflicts or anything about this party being in power or that party being in power, there is a economic incentive, it turns out, and this, this is what Prescott and I found in, our, in the first paper that was mentioned. Um, we've, there's an incentive to change policy in the future, and, and uh, we could refer to that as, the, as policy inconsistency over time. Uh, I'll give you uh, three or four acute examples of where uh, um, where that problem is likely to be the most serious. And then I'll bring up Argentina first as an example, very s a striking example, and I'll talk about Ireland as well as a striking example of the opposite of what Argentina did. Uh, finally, time permitting, I'll make some general remarks about what are the key factors uh, that foster econ uh, economic development and uh, what factors may hamper economic development. Uh, so first the uh, framework. These models are inhabited by millions of people. People are character characterized by their preferences over uh, goods and time into the indefinite future. Uh, like everyone, it's a, it's ha it has to be the case with everyone in this audience. We're uh, constrained by the budget constraints. The economy as a whole is constrained by its resource constraint. Uh, time is also a, a very important resource uh, constraining uh, behavior. Um, these model economies are forward looking. Uh, I always make Maybe, uh, maybe I overstated a little bit, but I don't really think so. I, I think almost all interesting macroeconomic phenomena are forward-looking, they're dynamic. The future plays a big role for the, the anticipation of the future plays a big role for the decisions that are made today. Uh, this is in, uh, in uh, great contrast with the framework that prevailed before, let's say in the 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, where, of course, economic models have always been concerned with economic behavior by households and businesses. But in the early portion, uh, or in the, over that period, the, the way models were formulated w was in the form of equations. Uh, they were postulated as equation for the key decision variables, such as consumption and investment, and uh, it was postulated what they depended on, and uh, and one relied, one hoped, on statistical methods to uh, to estimate the coefficients of these equations. So, for example, uh, a consumption equation, uh, somewhat simplified, but uh, income would be a big factor for consumption, and they might say something like. Uh, if income goes up by $1,000, then consumption goes up by $900. We, 
In other words, 90 cents for every, for every dollar increase in income. Well, there's no basis in economics for write, in dynamic ec economics to write down some, such an equation. What we understand is that uh, if, if the income increase is temporary, people will, uh, most people, or the aggregate of people, I mean, there are always exceptions, but the aggregate of people in the nation will save a large portion of the temporary in increase. For example, uh, this, uh, the so-called fiscal stimulus plan proposed by the U.S. government in uh, kind of in a response to the subprime mortgage crisis, um, the proposal is for a temporary tax reduction, in other words, a temporary income increase, and my prediction is that only maybe 10 percent of it will be spent. Um, on the other hand, if it's a permanent increase, in uh, in um, in uh, in income, then the prediction is that most of it would be spent, and this is something that comes out of a dynamic model that is c calibrated to uh, to uh, to the behavior of, as I said, millions of people, uh, and uh, as you'll see, also thousands of businesses. Well, that's already up here, and this, uh, this is a key, key component of all macroeconomic models. It describes the, um, th the capacity of a nation to, uh, to produce. Um, you may wonder how one can, uh, can describe the behavior of thousands and thousands of businesses in, form of, in the form of a simple uh, production function, but it, it does an amazingly good job. A and part of it is it gives a framework for thinking about many issues, uh, and many potential policy issues, and will they have an effect on the real economy. Uh, so that this, is a, this is a description of how the two main inputs into production, the sum of all, uh, all the capital, the capital in the form of factories, machines, office buildings, and so on, uh, on the one hand, and the input of the workers, the workers working these machines or working with the computers or working uh, uh, in these factories, they, uh, the total of the labor input by the workers, how those two factors get converted into goods and services. Goods and services that could either be in the form of consumption goods, non-durable, durable goods, or they could be in the form of investment goods, uh, goods that are put into new factories or new capital and will augment the, the, uh, the capacity in the future. Now, one important factor is technological change. So important that I have uh, made that bold face. Uh, it's important for several reasons. Uh, Traditionally, in, in macroeconomics, it was emphasized as the key engine for growth. It turns out, as was mentioned in the introduction, it's a factor also for generating business cycles. Um, and especially when you think about business cycles, in, in uh, what's called technological change, I would include uh, factors you wouldn't normally think of, but they are factors that could affect this transformation of capital and labor input into goods and services. Uh, they could be things like the oil shocks that hit in the 70s and early 80s. Could be things like um, changes in the nature of contracting between workers and, and businesses. Could be changes in uh, the government's provision of infrastructure. It could be uh, new regulations. It could be a banking panic. Or it could be something milder than a banking panic. It could be the subprime mortgage crisis. Uh, and the way either of those last two uh, um, examples could work, they, they, um, they re reduce the extent of financial intermediation that takes place in the economy. Financial intermediation in large part means that all the small amounts of savings coming from millions of people get 
translated into investment, uh, much bigger sums, and the banks uh, do much of this intermediation. Uh, very, very important function, and if it's if it's um, uh, hampered, if there's something happens to reduce the amount of financial intermediation, it's as if you throw sand into a, an otherwise well-functioning machine. Um, now, um, this is uh, this slide just emphasizes something uh, that it. It's not so important for today's talk, but I just wanted to mention that uh, personally I've been mostly interested in addressing quantitative questions, questions that demand uh, quantitative answers. And uh, like any measuring device, such as an economic model, I think of it as a measuring device, almost like a thermometer, uh, the simplest measuring device. It needs to be calibrated in order for the for, for the answer to be credible. And, and uh, calibrating like the thermometer just means you make sure that the model gives the right answer to questions whose answer you already know, and then you have faith in, the, in its ability to answer the questions you're searching uh, for answers to. Uh, now, it's time to introduce an important sector uh, for my talk. I've talked about the household sector and the business sector, but there's the government sector, and that's central to uh, what we'll uh, discuss today. Um, now, the government also faces a budget constraint, just like all of us. Um, and uh, the issue of um, a government ob objective could be a more controversial one. Maybe you can think of it as a stylized example where we abstract from many complications of policy making. We abstract from, for example, the fact that uh, some four-year periods there could be one government in power and some other four-year period there could be another and they, they may, might have different objectives. I'm going to assume that there is an unchanging objective for the government. Um, if I had the power to make everyone alike in this economy, the obvious objective would be the utility function, the description of preferences of the typical person. But even if they're heterogeneity, one can think of ways of, of describing the welfare of the nation as a whole. So let's, let's say one could write down such an objective. Um, The idea is the government tries to maximize this unchanging objective covering today and far into the future subject to its budget constraint, some subject to its intertemporal budget constraint. Uh, it, can, uh, it, it performs important services. They cost resources. The government generates revenue from taxes, for example. If, um, taxes fall short of, of uh, expenditures, then the government is also free to borrow uh, w with the idea of paying back in the future. So it's an intertemporal budget constraint. The uh, surprising finding uh, of that Prescott and I came up with was there is going to be this incentive to change behavior in the future. So suppose you come up with your plan that solves this, uh, this maximization problem, in other words, to make welfare as high as possible, um, subject to the budget constraint. It will turn out it has the property that it is probably well, it needs a commitment mechanism in order to be implemented. And if it doesn't have such a commitment mechanism, as Prescott and I showed in some uh, graphic examples, one in the context of uh, monetary policy, one in the context of fiscal policy, the outcomes could be very bad for society. Uh, now, 
I don't know how important it is to go into the, uh, the fundamental reasons for this time inconsistency. Uh, I suppose I'm uh, like uh, wh when, my, when my kids studied, uh, for example, uh, multiplying exponents, uh, for example, in high school and, uh, and, uh, and asked me to, uh, to, uh, to help them. And uh, I would go into the details about how you uh, some the exponents or something like that or the reasons for that and then uh, they was a I don't care about the underlying theory I just want the rule and uh, well I'm a professor so uh, I like to at least give the um, those who who are interested a, a sense of what's the what's behind this time inconsistency and the key uh, key reason is um, as I said, the government, in planning for the future, well, actually, uh, what I didn't say is there are so many decisions where anticipated future behavior by the government makes a difference for, for current economic behavior. One obvious example is investment behavior. A, a, um, millions and millions of dollars are expended to build a factory, let's say, um, that it will take years and years to recover that revenue and, and perhaps to recover that cost and perhaps generate some income on top of that. Uh, a factory may operate for 20 years. It generates revenue in the form of selling the, the products it was designed for. Uh, an important factor is what matters to the investor is what's left after the government has taken its share. Uh, and um, and that's, that's going to be important to think about in deciding whether this factory is worth, is it worthwhile to build it? Are the future revenues going to cover the cost? Will it yield a reasonable income after taxes? Uh, and uh, it's clearly going to be easier if you can forecast well what those future taxes are going to be. Uh, now when the government makes its plan, it's for it to be optimal for the society as a whole, it has to be a plan that takes into account how households and businesses will react to its policy. Uh, now let's Fast forward, uh, let's suppose uh, such a plan has been calculated and it's being implemented, time is elapsing, maybe five years uh, have elapsed. Suppose some hotshot uh, guy in the government's calculation office decides to sit down and recalculate the policy. The objective function has not changed under my assumptions. I'm uh, abstracting from the possibility that that could be different um, governments and power or anything. That, that's, that I'll regard as an additional complication. Um, so, so suppose the, the plan is being recalculated to see if the remainder of its policy, the policy for the, the now future, is the same, is, uh, was calculated correctly. Well, even if it were, if it were calculated cor correctly initially, um, the recalculation will yield a different policy. And the reason for that is the original policy took into account the effect the future would have on earlier decisions, including period zero, period one, and so on. Now we're in period five. The decisions in period 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4 have already been made. And so if the calculation is redone, presumably it will not take into account the effect uh, the future policy will have on decisions that have already been made. So that's, that's the key uh, uh, fundamental reason for, for the well, what we'll call time inconsistency for short. Sure. Where is the temptation the greatest? Uh, well, it turns out it's the greatest when, 
we're talking about decisions that imply that you're you're accumulating something over time. Um, for example, uh, the investment decision I already mentioned, uh, accumulating capital, physical capital over time. It also applies when uh, thinking about accumulating human capital. Uh, what all the students are doing, they're accumulating uh, intensely. They're, they're uh, accumulating human capital. The, uh, ability to uh, become more productive in the market sector in the future. That also uh, is a forward-looking decision if, if made rationally, if you think hard about it. And uh, for example, the decision whether to uh, make do with undergraduate education or, or go on for a master's or a PhD. Another example where it could hit hard is many have accumulated government bonds. In the United States, there are 30-year government bonds, there are 10-year government bonds. These are sold at the fixed normal interest rate. If the government were to uh, engineer a surprise inflation, uh, maybe even a hyperinflation, as as w we have seen in some Latin American countries. Hyperinflations are especially steep inflations. They could be hundreds and hundreds of percent per year, or even thousands of percent per year. Uh, it, it, if such an inflation is engineered, uh, and especially if it comes as a surprise, then the value of these bonds will drop to virtually to zero. Uh, they will uh, have virtually no value to the holders of them. Uh, the government is in the uh, uh, comfortable position that to pay back these bonds in real terms, it costs them virtually nothing to to pay them back. A and so this this is uh, one of the things that has happened in Latin in some Latin American countries. That these are examples where the time and consistency could hit hard. Um, so naturally, one must be looking for uh, what I call a commitment mechanism, me mechanism, a way to commit yourself to future, to the future portion of your policy. Um, the examples of such commitment mechanisms are more uh, are more prevalent in in the context of monetary policy than in fiscal policy uh, fiscal policy turns out to be much harder in uh, in the context of uh, monetary policy there's the uh, uh, there's a example that goes back 100 or 200 years the so-called gold standard uh, I won't have time really to go into detail about it Another example, is, it actually applies to Argentina. Argentina had just come, come out of a hyperinflation where uh, the value of the peso changed dramatically. Actually, it fell to virtu virtually zero under, uh, under the hyperinflation. I've heard rumblings about uh, uh, exchange rate fluctuations in Thailand and the Philippines. Well, what you've seen is nothing compared to what happened in in Argentina um, and um, so a, as a consequence when Carlos Menem came to power in 1990 after a particularly bad uh, decade as a trying to uh, shore up the uh, the uh, confidence in the peso uh, he accumulated dollar reserves and said that the Bank of Argentina which then ready to exchange pesos for dollars on a one-to-one -one basis. A and it turned out that worked for a while, but it fell, fell apart, and you'll see the consequences of that. And uh, in brief, the reason, it, one reason it fell apart was they did not uh, take into account the interaction between monetary policy and fiscal policy, and, uh, and uh, they, they, they um, did a pretty good job for a while to uh, uh, 
give conf confidence to monetary policy, but probably smart investors understood that there was this time bomb looming uh, in the future. Uh, so more typical is the third example, and that's independent central banks. Now, that it's, it's not a fail-safe measure, but there is lots of ev evidence that the more ev independent the central bank is, the, the more benign is the inflation environment. And we've, uh, we seem to have, well, uh, some people give uh, Prescott and me credit. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, uh, we deserve it, but we'll take it. Um, the, uh, there has, w one of the reasons that might seem reasonable is that these efforts to make banks more independent, these efforts have taken place over the past uh, 10 or 20 years. Uh, example is the Bank of England that used to be under the um, central government. Uh, in 1997, it be became independent. In um, Scandinavia, the ba central banks have become more independent. Uh, and one has seen efforts in other countries to, to at least they talk about the importance of making them independent. Argentina is an example where they don't even talk about it. Uh, there, this, the central bank head, there have been years where he was fired uh, half a dozen times, replaced by some other head uh, half a dozen times per year. Uh, astounding. A and with almost predictable consequences. Uh, now, in practice, what many of these, especially the banks characterized by a uh, higher degree of independence, what they do is they, they as they should, they, they try to be um, transparent about their policy so that people can see, people can tell if they are trying to fool you. Uh, so they try to be transparent by giving numerical targets for what the inflation rate is going to be. Targets that you won't always hit, hit exactly. Uh, I mean, that, that would be impossible, but uh, the idea is to, these will be the inflation rates on the average. And it has worked pretty well. Uh, I would say, though, after these um, inflation targeting regimes have come into place, we have been uh, facing rather benign environments. There haven't been any really big shocks. Uh, if the current one turns out to be bigger than usual, then we'll see if, they, if, this, really, if this really is something that works even uh, under the worst of circumstances. Um, uh, I, I guess I'll skip that. Uh, I, uh, it, it may, s well, let me say just a quick word. It may seem that price level targeting um, a target for the path of the price level would be equivalent to uh, saying what the inflation rate should be in every year. Uh, after all, the inflation rate represents the growth rate of the price level. Uh, I just think the, uh, I if we could have a uh, price level target instead of an inflation rate target, that would be a more transparent um, policy, one where it would be even clearer if uh, if the uh, if if the central bank is is starting to deviate from its from its target, so let's let's talk about the key forces behind economic growth. I already mentioned the technology uh, technological change or the results of uh, of uh, innovations, research and development. Uh, one discovers more efficient ways of producing stuff, new, new production processes, more, if, uh, more, more valuable, maybe, types of goods. A very important part of the economic development. But one cannot live by technological change alone. One needs capacity to take advantage, advantage of it. Um, one needs to be able to uh, to produce this stuff. In 
factories, in uh, office buildings, in uh, using uh, computers, and so on. And here's where the government comes back into the picture. The government may provide a favorable environment for such activity, and that's the case in some countries. On the other hand, there are countries in which they, the government's behavior, the government policy is clearly detrimental to such activities, to, uh, to, uh, to growth. And here's where I'll uh, bring in the example of Argentina. Unlike the previous slides, uh, uh, or plots, the ones you saw in the beginning, this is in proportional scale. So that straight line is the average growth rate in Argentina o over this period, a little over 50 years. Uh, and, and because the um, picture is in proportional scale, a constant growth rate shows up as a straight line. Uh, Argentina didn't exactly do that well, as you saw from the, my first plot. But uh, uh, at least in comparison or by standards of this whole 50-year period, the first 30 years were the best. Then came a 10-year period, I already mentioned, from exactly 1980 to 1990, a very bad period. Income per capita, or income, this is GDP per working age person, but that's, this is very close to income per capita. It fell by over 20% over a 10-year period. That's what one will call a Great Depression. And uh, that period is the reason I became interested in, um, in Argentina. I, I along with the co-author, were, we were asked to write uh, a paper to see that, uh, that episode in light of modern macroeconomic theory. Uh, before I get to that a little, uh, a little further, well, let me, let me stick with, uh, with that picture for, uh, and point out that from 1990, the, when uh, Menem took over, it looks like Argentina grew pretty fast. And then everything fell apart again. Another drop by over 20% in income per capita, and this time over a much shorter period, over four, five-year period only. A spectacular decline in in uh, in the inactivity. So, we we uh, wrote the paper about that lost decade you see, uh, but we because we had access to data going beyond 19 the 80s, uh, Carlos Sarasaga, as, as he's called, my co-author, we decided to plug in the numbers in a calibrated economy, a, a standard modern macroeconomic model, set up on the assumption that everything was functioning well, like uh, same as the type of model you would set up for the United States or for uh, Germany, or uh, except calibrated to, uh, to Argentina. And to our surprise, the model said, while it looked to the naked eye that Argentina had gr grown quite fast in the 1990s, the model said it should have grown even much faster, and the capital stock should have been substantially larger in, at the end of the 90s. Here's an illustration. Uh, I want to point out that this is now total GDP, not per capita, not per working age person, it's total. So that, for example, the uh, decline in the 1980s is not as large because in the meantime there was also a population increase. Uh, so the, w this picture, if it's per capita, then uh, in the 80s it will drop dramatically. Uh, this is what the model said should happen in comparison with the data. And even more striking, if you look at uh, the capital stock, as I keep emphasizing, uh, I mean, sometimes capital is, word capital is used for other things, 
when I talk about capital, it's either physical capital or human capital. And in this case, physical capital. The sum of the best measure of the sum of factories and machines and office buildings and so on in the economy. Uh, these are the data. The model said this should have happened. The model uh, does pretty well in uh, accounting for what happened in the last decade. It's really off w when it comes to the 90s. Uh, and I would argue that that's a sign that this was a sick pa patient. It's like you apply a thermometer to uh, a patient, and uh, if the temperature is up to 40, you know something needs to be done. Something is wrong. And the, to me, the model says something was wrong in Argentina in the 1990s. And what could that be? Carlos's and my explanation is that Argentina suffered from what we call the time inconsistency disease as a result of not only the bad experience in the 1980s, that was clearly most vivid in memory of potential investors, but there, it wasn't the first experience of that type. And so it's clear that Argentina suffered fr from a credibility problem fr uh, among investors. Here's a very depressing picture of what happened in Argentina from the beginning of 1980 until uh, early 2000. It's a picture of the capital stock per working age person. You see that it peaked in 1982 and then well I'll, I'll just tell you that in 2003 you see that it's much lower I, in fact it dropped by more than 20 percent this is very bad news for Argentine workers uh, the prediction when you have less capital to work with uh, the income will be lower Salaries will be lower per, wor per uh, hour or per, per year. And uh, some people will do better than others. The people with human capital tend to do better under uh, the, the deteriorating circumstances than, than uh, those with less. A and so the a prediction is that this, will, this decline will hit the poor especially hard. A and that's, in fact, what has happened. The poverty level in Argentina has been going up and up uh, until the end of this period. Um, it's true Argentina has recovered in the in the past three or four years. Uh, a question is, will they catch up? Will they surpass the 1970s level? Will they catch up? And that's that's an interesting question. A and all I can say is. Um, they don't give me the greatest confidence because they uh, keep talking about very short-run issues, short-run policy issues. They don't seem to be focusing on the long run, and and the long run must be what what one must have in mind in order to generate long-run e uh, growth in economic development. Um, what it will take to restore confidence is not so easy to say. The, uh, that's one of the things we know the least about in economics. What we do know is we need a policy geared for the long run. So I, I, have, I have emphasized several times, I, ca I can't emphasize it enough, uh, for economic development, one has to think about policies that foster productivity increase and capital accumulation. It must be forward-looking, it must be credible, and this is where, this is a good time to bring in my other country example, Ireland. 
Ireland is such a striking, uh, it represents such a striking difference from Argentina. They were really forward looking. Uh, I didn't, uh, Ireland, as you saw, was, um, they were among the uh, lower countries in Europe in terms of income per capita. Uh, they were down there among, uh, well, among others, Spain and, uh, and Greece and so on. Uh, in that period, they decided, uh, basically in the 60s, starting in the 60s, they decided to make secondary ed education free of charge. If you go 20 or 30 years on, then uh, Ireland finds itself with a potentially highly qualified potential workforce. They have high education, maybe not such uh, so much experience in, in working, not so much capital to work with. They still, uh, they still would have difficulty in uh, taking advantage of that high education. So what does the government do? They say, in, and this uh, uh, happened around 1990, they said, if you, and you meaning not just Irish uh, businesses, but also foreign businesses, if you set up shop in Ireland, uh, we know it's going to be a heavy expense. Returns will come far into the future. These will be the taxes facing you, not just the first year after the factory is done, not just the second year, but all the way to 2009. And these were reasonably low taxes. It had a uh, tremendous effect on the growth of Ireland. Uh, and what I especially want to emphasize is the transparency, the removal of uncertainty about the government's behavior, about government policy. There's enough uncertainty in the world as it is. There's no need for additional uncertainty coming from the government. And that's what Ireland was successful in removing. Um, I guess I'm running out of time. Uh, so uh, th this is the next to the last slide. And, and it's, it's, it talks generally about some of the problems with economic development in, in many nations. Uh, one of the biggest problems is that um, the, uh, in, in many nations, the set of technologies that can be adapted, they're prevented from being adapted. This could be for many reasons. It could be the holders of the alternative old-fashioned technologies, uh, vested interests. They uh, have the ear of the politicians, and they're somehow able to, to um, uh, make the politicians institute policies that would discourage modern technology to be implemented. It could be could happen through restrictions to through tariffs w that would benefit the existing technologies, etc. There is a lot of knowledge available. Uh, much of it can be transferred easily to from country to country, not necessarily applicable directly. It may re they may require additional country-specific innovative activity. They may, in fact, be because of the situation in those countries. They they may they may be somewhat different than uh, what you see in the uh, most developed countries. They may take advantage of the resource base in those countries. They may take advantage of the existing education level, of the, uh, of the skill levels of the population. But there's a lot, that, lot of knowledge that can be transferred. I'd like to end with a paraphrase of the last sentence in a book by Parenta and Prescott. Uh, the book is called Barriers to Riches, and um, this, this is a very interesting book about, it's a very compact book, uh, a nice combination of some theory and some, a lot of empirical uh, observations about different countries, countries 
that did well in some episodes and not so well in other episodes, China, for example, or uh, 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 Korea, that Korea has done so spectacularly well since 1965, documenting uh, the magnitudes of some of the uh, growth successes and also some of the failures. Uh, and so uh, they, they end the book by saying, with good economic, with good policy, there is potential in poor nations for not one to two percent, but one thousand to two thousand percent income increases. Perhaps cute to add those three zeros behind each of those two um, figures, but it's actually in the ballpark if you think about it. If you think about some of these examples of the African nations where the income per capita was about 500 or 1,000, you increase that by 1,000 percent, you get up to 5,000 or 10,000, and that's still well below many, many countries. Uh, but those are the kinds of goals, I think, these countries should think about, they should think about their institutions, they should think about removing corruption, they should think about enabling, making it easier to import new technologies so that they can have these increases over, well, it may take uh, two or three decades, but it, it's certainly worthwhile. And to get back to my initial title, I think the conditions for, for long-lasting peace would be much better in many of these countries. Thank you very much. At this point, may we request the kind Professor Kedland to come up stage, please, and to be seated at the table. While we call on Professor Francisco M. Largo, Chair of the University of San Carlos Department of Economics, to moderate the dialogue. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. There are microphones at the middle aisle. When you have a question, please raise your hand and I will recognize you. When you are recognized, please clearly state your name and institutional affiliation. Thank you. May we have the icebreaker, please? Yes, sir. Hi, my, my name is Tony Pineda and I'm with the Cebu Business Club. Uh, I'm also a senior fellow of the Development Academy of the Philippines. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Kidland for the very enlightening sharing of the results of your research. Um, I'm, I'm right now doing a project with the Asian Productivity Organization. And what we're doing for the member, for the member countries we're looking at the economic development of each of those countries uh, as compared with uh, other factors that are related to those like and we're using the GCR ratings uh, for that for 2002 to 2006 so we've classified the 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 20 member nations into four tiers uh, of which like countries like Japan and and the uh, Singapore in the first tier, while the Philippines has graduated from being in tier four uh, to tier three from 2006, uh, 2002 to 2006. Now, one of the surprising things, and so I'm, I'm particularly working on the tier three countries, especially the Philippines, and one of the surprising things that, that I have observed which supports or, or which verifies some of the uh, uh, observations that you shared about the different countries, but, well, is that, well, for the tier one and tier two countries, most of the 
development, particularly econo in economic performance, is actually fueled or driven by the government policies, particularly on transparency and good governance and, and, and things as such. Uh, in the Philippines, what's surprising is that one of the highest rated factors is actually economic performance itself, while all the other factors uh, in terms of uh, enhancers, performance enhancers and innovation itself are rated very, very low and are either erratic and not yet even improving. Uh, in case in point would be even basic education and uh, say higher education and, and available specialized training. So our analysis of that is that most of the, the, the performance in terms of economics as far as the Philippines is concerned may have been driven by the, pub, the, by the private sector because many of the, their exemplary companies that have invested in the Philippines, and these are the multinationals and, uh, and the local big companies also. So m the question I wanted to ask is that it seems like for the tier one and tier two countries, most of the improvements have been really driven by government initiatives in terms of education, in terms of research institutions, and in terms of even incentives and, and the transparency of the policies. However, uh, I'm not sure that in a country like where technological change or efforts of the government towards technological change is even you know, uh, hampered by corruption such as what's happening now. Uh, so, do you think that it will be, as a matter of a, like a strategy for growth, would it be possible that these things can be driven by private sector initiatives rather than government initiatives like what we have observed in the better performing economies in Asia? Thank you, sir. I thought that was very interesting, and um, I absolutely think that growth can be driven by private initiatives. In fact, I, I would th I'm surprised that you find the extent you do uh, that initiatives have to be initiated initiated by by the government. When I talk about the conditions being in place for for uh, for economic de development i think uh, um, the government simply i don't necessarily think of the government as making the decisions themselves about um, a capital accumulation and and research and development and so on what must be the case is that private decision makers feel confident that if they engage in such activity the fruits will come to them in other words they they will earn a reasonable income in the long run and that the government won't turn around uh, sometime five years in the in the future and and change the policy in such a way that these private decisions turn out to be uh, not not so smart exposed, uh, and, and um, so so I I would answer your question by saying I I would I would think that most most of the decisions that result in economic development m they would typically come from the private sector sector from uh, from individuals deciding whether they want to uh, accumulate more education of course uh, the educational system has to be in place for for it to be for them to be able to do so uh, it, it must be that businesses both domestic and and uh, for many countries 
foreign businesses feel this this is a country where uh, there's enough credibility, th there's enough long-run uh, prospects, enough stability, uh, lack unlikelihood of regulations or uh, anti-competitive measures being being taken in the future that we can we can feel confident to go ahead. Yes, uh, next question, please. Yes, sir. Kindly come to the middle aisle. Um, yes, um, good afternoon. I am Aaron Pedrosa, a second year law student at the College of Law here in San Carlos. Um, it was quite interesting. Oh, could I? Yeah, uh, sir? Uh, I, I am having trouble hearing here, maybe. Because so, if you could speak up. Uh, yeah, I'm Aaron Pedrosa, a second-year law student of the College of Law of San Carlos here in Main Campus. Um, there are ec economists in the country, progressive economists at that, who actually argue that the disparity between economists of the economists rather of the world is caused uh, not so much about country-specific policies. Uh, crafted by the individual or respective countries, but the policies which um, are creditor oriented. I, I noticed that from your presentation, uh, we did not really go into the underlying causes of um, the disparity. For example, what happened in Argentina in 2002-2003, it defaulted on its payment of debts debts which have become unsustainable. Um, as far as creditors are concerned, international creditors such as the World Bank, International Monetary Fund, among others, are concerned only um, in the capacity of governments to pay, regardless of the social costs of uh, these governments or the impact of the, uh, of its of the governments. Um, how do we view debts um, as a factor, uh, uh, an important uh, contributing factor to the poverty of nations. Because about two years ago, three years ago, the Philippines was projected to be following the same uh, fate as that experience in Argentina. We had what was called then as fiscal crisis. Um, now they say that the fiscal crisis has been um, addressed. But our debt situation remains the same. We pay at the expense of the social services. And we know for a fact that there are many countries around the world, specifically African and Asian countries, who have um, huge debts to creditors, creditor in international lending institutions. So how do we view um, that as a factor to the continuing poverty of countries? Thank you. What happened in Argentina? My, my, my point was that if Argentina had had the credibility of investors, Argentina would have grown substantially faster. Um, it is true that they had an issue about a fiscal policy in the sense that the provinces could borrow without a balanced budget constraint. In the United States, for example, each state except for one has a balanced budget uh, constraint. Um, um, they, um, the provinces in Argentina uh, ran up large debts and then they couldn't uh, repay them and then they came running to the federal government whose, whose debt then ballooned. Now, all of these problems probably could have been averted if somehow Argentina had had the confidence in uh, starting from the very beginning from from 1990, if, if Carlos Menem could have come to, to power 
in the in the country that already had the credibility, to, that had the confidence among investors, that hadn't experienced the uh, the 1980s, then then that investment would have taken place. Um, the uh, Argentina would have been much closer to what, what the model said in my pictures should have happened, and that would have made a big difference. Uh, it would have it would have kept um, oh, oh, it would have kept Argentina from uh, from falling from uh, from uh, experiencing the f the fall you saw in the capital stock per working age person. It, it's true that debt can be used for many purposes. What what is typical in uh, in development experiences is that countries trying to catch up borrow so that they can invest more easily, so that they can invest not only using its own domestic resources, but to speed up the development. They borrow from abroad so that the investment, the growth can take place, take place faster. And then the idea is that when that growth has taken place, when you're getting closer to having caught up, then because the economy is much more productive, the income per capita is much higher, you will be in a position to pay back. And that, that's what happened in uh, many European countries that's what happened in Norway, for example, when it was developing in, in, the, uh, in the early part of the 20th century. Um, now, it is also true that in, in many, many countries, the uh, debts have been run up for different reasons. Uh, I would suggest that the, the reasons for the Argentine debt to be run up as was suggested by about 2000, the reasons were not very productive reasons. The uh, the uh, uh, the spending that that had uh, caused that run of in the in the debt, the data suggest it wasn't very productive, and that's that's a dangerous thing, and, and that's the kind of thing that will uh, will uh, make confidence difficult to restore. If, if you engage in one or two episodes like that, then uh, uh, the potential investors or lenders will be much more reluctant to, uh, to lend to that country. Yes, sir? The gentleman in front raised his hand first. The gentleman in gray will be next. Yes, my name is my name is Anthony Jackson. I'm a retired businessman. Uh, Professor Killen, I lived in the Argentine uh, in the 1940s, when there was quite considerable prosperity, and I lived in Ireland in the 1950s, when <laughs> when there was not much prosperity. Things have changed now, as you have said, and my question is. Uh, Yes, indeed. <coughs> uh, would the situation not be quite different than it is now if the enormous subsidies that have gone to Ireland had instead gone to Argentina? Um, on one of my slides I said, but one cannot live by technological change alone. I could also have said, but one cannot live by subsidies alone. Um, it is true that Ireland received some subsidies from the European Union. Uh, that they were part of helping Ireland to make the investments faster. Ireland used those, those subsidies very well, but the main factor has to be that the productive capacity was built up, and I don't think those subsidies were so instrumental for 
for building up the, the, the productive capacity. They may have been used for building up infrastructure and, uh, and, and contributing to the government budget constraint in, the other I in various ways. But I don't think the government was the one to, initiative the, to initiate the, uh, the projects that resulted in, in such a productive e economy. And so there, ha there had to be something more to it. And I think the, while the, f the two factors are mentioned, the, uh, the build-up of educa uh, education or the, uh, a more educational population and the forward-lookingness of the, uh, of the uh, tax schedule, I don't claim that those were the only factors, but I believe they were important factors. Yes, may we now have the uh, question from the gentleman in grey. Oh, and to, uh, while that's taking place, and if they had gone to Argentina, they would have just... <laughs> Good afternoon, Professor. I'm Rosello Rivas-Sintista from the Department of Political Science in the University of San Carlos. I'm kind of interested in your recommendation saying that the government should give incentives towards the private sector. The question there is how much can we trust the private sector? I mean, for instance, in the Philippines, we have what is known as the patron clientelism um, phenomenon, wherein the, instead of the government will give incentives, but instead of it going towards the markets, it will go towards very large monopolies, companies. Whoever controls the, the economy of this, of this particular country, the Philippines, is probably around less than 20 people. How can we, therefore, resolve this issue on incentives, Professor? I wasn't so much talking about giving direct incentives. I, I was talking about providing an environment where you feel confident that the fruits of the investment will befall to the people carrying them out. And so, um, for example, one way in which the, the time and consistency disease w could, could hit when it comes to, to, um, to capital accumulation is um, you do as Ireland has uh, did and you say taxes it will be low and, uh, and investment is carried out. I, I don't think of that as providing an incentive per se. You just say the tax rates will be so and so. Uh, so there's no direct payment to, to the businesses, for example, in return for engaging in those activities. Now what could be tempting if the government runs into trouble in their budget, once these factories have been built, once they have been accumulated, the way the time and consistency problem would hit is it would appear to be a good idea to naive policymakers to raise the taxes on the income from the factories that have already been built. The idea is that they, it's very unlikely they will be shut down just because the taxes go up uh, more than had been promised. Uh, they will probably uh, chug along. It would seem like a cheap way to generate additional uh, government revenue. That's an example preventing such a situation, preventing a situation where you, you live as an, incentive, uh, as an investor in fear of a government doing something in the future that will make your investment worth much less, maybe uh, in, in some case Lose, lose entirely your investment. That's the kind of uh, th that's the kind of thing I'm, I'm uh, thinking about primarily. Not so much providing cash or other incentives. That may be useful also I in some instances, but uh, not really what I, what I was focusing on. Yes, the lady in. Uh Can I stay here or I should go? Oh. Yeah. 
I am Felisa Etemadi of UP Cebu. Um, the invitation says, peace and economic development in the era of globalization by, uh, of course, uh, Professor Kidlan. And uh, your lecture is very enlightening, but some of us in the audience are expecting you to expound on issues in a global in the globalization context. Issues like government policy in relation to debt, trade, um, poverty, and environmental sustainability when we talk about uh, economic development. So will you please pick on an issue and discuss it in a global globalization context? Thank you. Uh, I believe I already did when I talked about th there's a lot of n knowledge available in, in the world. One of the uh, great benefits of the globalized economy where knowledge flows much more easily with the help of internet and other technolog technological advances, um, there is much less excuse now uh, and also with a much greater ease of traveling uh, and so on. Um, uh, now the aggregate production function says that the higher the capital stock per person, the higher will be the wage rate. And all the data uh, back that up. Now it's true that the economy consists of many uh, many different groups of people. There are people with high skills, low skills, people with high education, low education, uh, and, and of course most of the people are in, in between. Uh, for short, there are people with high human capital for, for producing in the market sector. There are someone in between and then people who for various reasons have not accumulating so, accumulated so much human capital. What I said was, in, in the situation such as Argentina, where there's deficient economic development for whatever reason, the high human capital people, and Argentina is a country with fairly, fairly, uh, there are fairly good education in, in many parts of the country. Uh, in such a country, the, um, with deficient economic development, pr probably, and again, I think the data back that up, the higher human capital people are likely to do relatively better. Uh, the poor are the ones to suffer. And uh, as a consequence of, of that deficient economic development, we have seen the income distribution in Argentina become wider, the poverty level rising. If Argentina could reverse that trend, or if, if they could have prevented it from having happened in the first place, the current poor people in, most of the current poor people in Argentina would have been much better off. Yes, ma'am. The lady in the third row. Hello, sir. My name is Sarah. I'm from Taiyuan University of Technology in Shanxi Province, China. Um, my question is, you said good economic policy leads to economic growth. And China is clearly experiencing tremendous economic growth right now. Um, how would you characterize their economic policy? And do you think their success can be attributed to a strict political agenda similar to the economic recovery in Chile under General Pinochet? You bring up two countries that I haven't studied. Um, Chile. Um, Maybe if I had been from Chicago, I would have uh, known the answer to your question about Chile. Um, I, I don't really know the details about Chile, and uh, I have to admit, 
China is, um, you would have to enlighten me. Now, there is one thing I can say about Chile, however, and that is um, a few months ago I was in Costa Rica at the conference arranged by an institution called the Copenhagen Consensus. And what they do is every, every now and then they, they, they get experts together to think about a particular region or a particular part of the world or maybe the whole world and um, think about possible projects that could be undertaken. Suppose you had $50 billion to apply to a particular project. Where would you, you spend those $50 first? $50, million, $50 billion first? Or maybe divide them into uh, five, ten $10 billion chunks? In other words, to come up with a priority r list. Uh, so they invite experts to uh, do cost-benefit analysis for maybe a, a total of 50 different projects. I participated in the conference uh, at the co in, Ch in uh, Costa Rica covering or discussing only the Latin American region. To me, a very interesting region because of uh, some countries actually most of the region falling behind the rest of the world steadily, falling, certainly falling behind Europe and then North America, also falling behind steadily many parts of Eastern Asia, for example. Um, now, it so happened that during, uh, during that conversation in one of the groups, uh, and this conversation had, uh, had to do with possible forms of democracies, fo forms of constitutions that could be institutionalized in, in the various countries, perhaps uh, suggest changes in these countries. Uh, and it became clear that these constitutions are quite different in, uh, for example, Chile versus Ar Argentina versus Peru, uh, and so on. A and so to clarify, I'm not the political scientist, so, so to clarify in my own mind, what exactly does this mean? Uh, I asked the following question to the to the uh, to the e to the expert. I said, um, in Norway, uh, a country with which I am familiar, in Norway, uh, they are now accumulating a an oil fund. Norway was fortunate enough to hit upon oil in the early 1970s. Uh, and they have decided to save most of it for future generations. Uh, so far, the oil fund is one times Norway's annual GDP. It's projected by 2020 to grow to five times annual GDP. D GDP. And Norway has agreed on a decision rule for what pro portion of the oil fund can be spent on current expenditures every year some small proportion. Uh, this decision rule has been followed whether uh, the Labour Party has been in power or the, uh, a coalition of more centrist or, or parties toor towards the right. It has not been broken uh, in spite of, from time to time, pretty heavy political pressure on the governments. So I asked Suppose, uh, suppose we think of that example. Under what constitution would something similar be likely to happen in Latin America? And he answered, uh, well, in, it so happens in, uh, in Chile, uh, there is also a, a fund. There it's called the Copper Fund. And it's been being accumulated for similar reasons. And, and under Chile's uh, constitution, it had w has worked very well, and uh, politicians have not been able to touch it. If that fund had been in Argentina, it would have been gone in a minute. S so, so, so those are those are, to me, to my mind, those are examples. They are rather deep examples. They're. There are complicated examples about 
how to set up institutions, how, how to set up the political uh, apparatus in the different countries. Uh, should one rely more on uh, on on decentralized decisions for rather than decisions in the central government and so on? Uh, very important uh, issues to think about, but the goal must be to think about how you can do it in such a way that you can foster economic development. Chile has been able to do so over the past 20 or 30 years to a much greater extent than uh, just about any country in Latin America. It appears we only have time for two more questions, so I'd like to recognize the lady in the middle aisle. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Diane Ralion, uh, representing the Office of Councillor Mr. Archival. Uh, that was a good uh, presentation of your research, and uh, my concern might be some kind of, uh, we might be implementing it, hopefully, in this city but the quest but my observation is that uh, there was there were statements like peace begins with education so and then the title is peace and economic development to this era of globalization but however I think uh, we have a mismatch of policies with the current uh, uh, situation of the Philippines right now and looking at your uh, magazine who said Venetia is here and it's an irony for big bridges for devel development. Okay, okay. so uh, looking at the situation of the Philippines, and particularly in Cebu, if we say that peace begins with education, I think this has to be thought over by, acad by the academe and the other sectors because there was a call for the business sector to invest in education. But if you look at the educational system, if we are trying to pull our pull our resources in terms of human capital, not all of us can reach a uh, college education. And every year, tuition fees are increasing. In terms of the agricultural uh, milieu, if you look at, we are supposed to be an agricultural country, but we intend to do the other way. We cannot even uh, reach the uh, expectations or the standards of WTO, which makes our farmers go back to the poverty level. So I think with the models that you have presented, sir, uh, how do you look at this in terms of the context of the Philippine scenario when everything's, uh, most, uh, most of the policies are not being implemented, no implementing rules and, and uh, guidelines to, to simplify what we are experiencing. We may have uh, an experience of dollar, peso going up, dollars going down, but then uh, it seems like when dollars go down and peso go up, still the labor sector would say the OFWs or the, the overseas workers would also clamor that it should be at the standard level. So uh, in your coming to the Philippines, how do you look at the Philippine economic scenario vis-a-vis -vis your study? I wish I could spend another week in... Uh Um, maybe I should have done more homework. Um, unfortunately, I spent only two days here, and so uh, I have had discussion enough discussions with people that I'm starting to get a sense of what's going on here. You are uh, contributing to uh, to that sense, and um, if I read you right, you're not painting a pretty picture. Um, and that would be that would be said. Uh, the uh, assuming your concerns are valid, uh, they seem like good examples of what you don't want to do as a government in order to pr promote economic development. See, my in my presentation, I I have 40 minutes, and I maybe I use 50. I, I don't remember. Uh, I'm sure Uber knows. Uh, the, um, I can only touch about so many things. There are so many details you could think about, details of how you could implement um, a favorable policy environment in practice. 
and you focused on, um, you seem to focus on local development, and that's, that's important and valid. I'm a macroeconomist, so, uh, so I, I guess I'm, uh, I'm asked mostly to think about the nation as a whole. Um, but, but there are many things one can learn also from what goes on at the, at the local level. And uh, um, to, to document what, what you're saying and, and also to uh, show that here are some things that don't work, uh, I'm sure many would appreciate learning that. Why the politicians wouldn't understand that in the in the first place? It's uh, it's hard for me as an understand as an outsider to uh, to really comment and uh, and speculate on it. Last question, please. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, I am Nelson Palumpa, sir. I used to handle a foreign assisted projects before. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, if we remember that uh, the Philippines suffered a uh, crisis it, like uh, in Thailand, uh, Malaysia, in Southeast Asia, so, my question is, uh, can, is there any agency that, uh, uh, re that uh, control the investment, particularly the di direct foreign investment to withdraw the, the investment in this particular region? to avoid recession in that uh, country. My second question, uh, since uh, the country relies on the uh, treasury, treasury bills and treasury bonds to spend the, to use this, spend the development, uh, is is uh, our multilateral uh, agency is our multilateral agency uh, advised to to this country pertaining to the the investment of the projections of the economy in bonds and government notes and bonds and bills, sir. That's all. I'm not sure I can say much about the second question. The first question you raise is a very interesting one, and. Uh, well, I'm not saying the second one isn't, but I, uh, I'm, a less, uh, I'm less qualified to talk about it. The, f the, the first one, I don't think, I don't believe any particular agency or organization or even government should be in charge of choosing investment projects. Um, oh, to uh, comment on what you said first, I'm surprised you say Philippines were hit uh, by a, a big recession, a, a big crisis. I assume you're talking about uh, 1997, and when I look at my picture, I was, I was impressed with how smooth the picture was for, for the Philippines. For Thailand, where I, ca where I spent the five days before I came here, the picture for Thailand, there's a dis uh, clear drop in uh, GDP per capita in, in Thailand starting in about 1997, a clear drop. Uh, so it seems that you were hit much less than, um, than, uh, than for example, Thailand and, and many other countries. But back to your question about, uh, about directing investment, if I understand you correctly, 
I just don't think that governments or particular organizations or I don't think any anyone put in charge of doing something like that would be the ones who would know where the most productive opportunities are. I, I think those who are, it's the private decision makers who, uh, who, uh, who understand in depth what it uh, pays to do, where, 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 uh, where the investments should be made. Assuming the government puts the environment in place so that uh, it's a it's a um, benign uh, investment environment in general. Uh, I suppose I could even there was an earlier question about China, and I never I guess I never touched upon China. I just talked about Chile. China, my oh, it, this is dangerous to talk about because I haven't really followed China. But my impression is that. China, in China, investment has been, to a large extent, directed. And that can work fine for quite a while, especially when you start from a low level. China started from a very low level in terms of income per capita. Many projects, just about any project, reasonable project you might undertake, will do well. And uh, in China, for example, um, they had, they had very cheap uh, labor imp input, uh, so I guess it's not so hard to think of uh, projects that could take advantage of that situation. If China were to become more developed, then it becomes more of a challenge, and I don't think the government in China will uh, is going to be the one who is most proficient in terms of identifying the projects. It must be that the economy eventually um, uh, develops in such a way that the private decision makers make most of the decisions uh, and uh, I, I guess I would find it unlikely that that would happen unless somehow China became more democratic uh, and somehow something was done so that uh, this is something that benefits the masses in in uh, in in China. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That will be all for the open forum. Actively participated and interacted with our lecturer. At this point, Father President Salazar will present the San Carlos Borromeo Award to Professor Finn Erling Kidland. Father Salazar will be assisted by Father Teodoro P. Gapus, SVD, Vice President for Academic Affairs, and Engineer Jesus Alcordo, Chair of the USC Board of Trustees. Father, please. May we request Professor Kidland to please stay at the center of the stage. Father President will read the citation. Together with this San Carlos Borromeo Award, we are giving, in appreciation for his presence and presentation, a book, a commemorative book of the University of San Carlos. And our university, as you may know, is named after San Carlos Borromeo. The reason is that sometime in our history, what is now University of San Carlos was just a Colegio de San Carlos, and it was also a Seminario de San Carlos. There was a time it was a Seminario Colegio de San Carlos. The reason why it was called after San Carlos Borromeo was that in his lifetime, Carlos Borromeo insisted that future priests should be well educated. He insisted that there be a formal course of studies. So when he was made a saint, many seminaries all over the world were named after him, including Colegio Seminario de San Carlos. And so the name San Carlos stands for integrity in preparation, in academic preparation. And this is the reason why we are giving our guest of honor an award named after Carlos Borromeo. University of San Carlos then presents this San Carlos Borromeo Award to 
Professor Finn Erling Kidlan, 2004 Nobel Laureate for Economics, for exemplifying in his life and work the ideals of Scientia Virtus Devotio of our patron and our university. Given on this eighth day of February in the year of our Lord 2008 at the University of San Carlos, Cebu City, I sign in the name of the whole university and present this San Carlos Borromeo Award. Congratulations, Dr. Kidlan. There is another award that we should make. The reason why Professor Kidlan is here was because someone brought the Nobel laureates beyond Thailand to the Philippines. It reminded us that one day in his lifetime, our founder, the founder of Society of the Divine Word, Arnold Johnson, said that his missionary should go beyond the borders of Europe to Asia. And one of the last countries that he said his missionary should go would be to the Philippines. He may not have known in his lifetime that eventually his missionaries would go to Colegio de San Carlos, which would become University of San Carlos. It is that kind of thinking that has brought our guest to us today. This is the reason why we are giving this St. Arnold Johnson Award to Uwe Morowitz, founding chairman of International Peace Foundation. Dr. Molevitz, we give you this award for exemplifying in your life and work the ideals of St. Arnold Johnson, founder of the Missionary Congregation, Society of the Divine Word, Societas Verbi Divini, particularly for bringing to the Philippines and the University of San Carlos the event series Bridges Towards a Culture of Peace, given today. I sign in the name of the university, Thank you, Dr. Uwe Morewitz. We give you this St. Arnold Johnson Award. 